This is Nightline and I'm Mohammad Ahmad Hamdan. News making the headlines. Langkawi open to fully vaccine international tourists from November 15th. And Malaysia's vaccination rollout for teens among fastest in the world. Our headlining story, international tourists who wish to visit Langkawi are allowed to do so beginning November 15th through the international tourism bubble inbound for the Langkawi pilot project. Prime Minister Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said the decision was made after the COVID-19 pandemic management special committee had agreed to the standard operating procedures SOP proposed by the Tourism, Arts and Culture Ministry of MOTEC on the tourism bubble. In a statement on Friday, the Prime Minister said the target group was high-yield tourists as well as individuals who had completed the COVID-19 vaccination. He added children under the age of 18 must be present with their parents or guardians who have been fully vaccinated, while the list of countries allowed will be determined by the Immigration Department, Health Ministry and Foreign Ministry. In addition, Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri said no quarantine conditions would be imposed, while tourists would have to stay for at least three days and undergo RT-PCR tests, where the results should be either in digital or printed form. The Prime Minister added tourists staying for more than five days were required to do a screening test on the fifth day with all costs borne by themselves, and those found positive will be taken to isolation or quarantine centres or private hospitals. Each tourist also must have minimum insurance coverage of 80,000 US dollars and use a tourism service license under MOTAC. They are also required to have a passport, visa, health declaration form, and letter of undertaking and indemnity with the documents uploaded and registered with the MySajatra application prior to traveling. Only a maximum of 20 people are allowed in a tour group, and having a guide is mandatory. The International Tourism Bubble pilot project in Langkawi would be carried out for three months to enable the authorities to evaluate its effectiveness before implementing it in other resort islands and tourist areas. Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri also announced that the states of Johor and Trunganu will move to Phase 4 of the National Recovery Plan, NRP, effective Monday following the latest risk assessments carried out by the Health Ministry and the National Security Council. In other news, Dr. Sri Ismail said the government has approved the SOPs proposed by the Human Resource Ministry for foreign workers to enter the country. He said the move was in response to labour shortages, particularly in the plantation sector. Among others, the SOPs require that the workers must be fully vaccinated in their home countries using vaccines approved by the World Health Organization and produce certificates to prove this. The workers are to enter only via KL International Airport and KLIA2 and must also undergo the RT-PCR test 72 hours before departure. They will have to undergo a seven-day quarantine, which will be coordinated by the Health Ministry, and an RT-PCR test will be done on the second day and fifth day of quarantine. Those found to be positive will be isolated at private low-risk quarantine centres, while those in categories 3, 4 and 5 will be referred to private hospitals. Once quarantine is completed and the workers are confirmed to be negative, they will be taken to their employers. Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri said the same SOP will later be enforced on all sectors and approval to bring in workers from abroad will be on a case-by-case -case basis. Malaysia is among the countries with the fastest adolescent COVID-19 vaccination rollouts in the world. Health Minister Kairi Jamaluddin said in less than two months, 80% of adolescents aged between 12 and 17 have received at least one dose of the Pfizer vaccine. In a Twitter post on Friday, Kyrie highlighted that based on his ministry's data on the COVID Now portal, a total of 1,367,216 individuals, or 43.4% of adolescents aged 12 to 17, have completed their vaccination as of Thursday. 
another 2,524,156 individuals were administered at least the first dose of the vaccine since the National COVID-19 Immunization Program for the Adolescent Group was launched on September 8. As for the adult population, a total of 22,084,594 individuals, or 94.3%, have completed their COVID-19 vaccination as of Thursday. Kyrie also said after nine months of operations, the CITF held its final meeting on Friday and thanked everyone in the task force for making the National COVID-19 Immunization Program a success. It was reported that the CITF will be dissolved on October 31st, while the vaccination program would now be placed under the CITF-A and the Vaccine Booster Program, CITF-B, chaired by Kyrie. Moving on, all civil servants have to comply with the rules set in the circular issued by the Public Service Department, or PSD, that has made it mandatory for all civil servants to complete their COVID-19 vaccination before November 1st. Chief Secretary to the Government, Tansri Muhammad Zuki Ali, on Friday warned that disciplinary action can be taken against those who refuse to get vaccinated. Tansri Muhammad Zuki said since many civil servants have returned to their respective offices, those who refuse to be vaccinated would only cause discomfort among their colleagues and create negative perception towards the public service. On another matter, he revealed that the operation of government offices would be fully reopened after all states have moved to phase four of the National Recovery Plan. According to the PSD, nearly 98% of government employees have been vaccinated, while 1.6% or 16,902 people have yet to register. The decision to make it mandatory for all civil servants to take the jab was made to boost public confidence and ensure the smooth delivery of public services to the people in line with efforts to restore the government services to full operational level. Malaysia's capabilities in handling the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the country's success in its vaccination program, has helped to boost the confidence of U.S. investors and tourists alike as Malaysia is transitioning into the endemic phase. U.S. Ambassador to Malaysia, uh, to Malaysia Brian D. McFeeter said these factors have further enhanced U.S. companies' confidence in the country, especially those involving strategic and high-impact sectors such as digital industries. McFeeter said the Malaysian government had done an admirable job in coping with the COVID-19 pandemic with its high vaccination rate, which is also one of the fastest countries in the world. He said the government's move to ease movement restrictions by reopening economic and social sectors and recently reopening the state borders would help to boost tourism activities and enable companies in the country which have been looking to fully resume their operations. I mean, American companies have, you know, they've complied with all of the SOPs and they've, at sometimes they've had to restrict their production. They want to, Malaysia is important in the global supply chain, so the ability to resume production at full levels has helped. The ability to travel helps, you know, business people. It also helps us, frankly. The embassy can do more. So it's all good news and we hope it continues. He added that the United States has had a strong and consistent partnership with Malaysia for some time, with about 25 billion U.S. dollars worth of investments in the country. You know, since I've been here, I've heard a lot about Malaysian government plans, My Digital, Jendela, things like that. Every time I see those, I think American companies are extremely well suited to be part of that. We have, you know, leading uh, not only semiconductor companies here, but we have cloud companies. Microsoft just announced a $1 billion investment in Malaysia. Uh, including the plan to, to uh, train one million Malaysians. So the United States is very aligned with Malaysia's aspirations on the digital side. He was speaking to reporters during a corporate visit to Media Prima Berhad at Sri Pantas on Friday. On hand to welcome the ambassador was Media Prima Berhad Group Chairman, Datuk Sri Dr. Said Hussein Aljunit and Managing Director Rafiq Razali. During the three-hour visit, delegates from the U.S. Embassy in Malaysia together with Media Prima Berhad top management engaged in discussions concerning future possibilities for further collaboration. They were also taken on a short tour of the Media Prima Rev Media Group office, Media Prima Radio Conti and Media Prima News Studio. 2022, a critical year for Malaysia. Jump-starting an economic recovery and rebuilding fiscal resilience, minimizing economic scarring, 
and assisting those hard hit by COVID-19. What to prioritize in the 2022 budget with Socioeconomic Research Center Executive Director Li Heng Jui on Money Matters this Saturday at 5 p.m. only on TV Tiga. The forced labour national action plan will be launched next month as an approach to deal with forced labour issue in the country, including the rubber glove manufacturing sector. Human Resources Minister Dr. Sri M. Saravanan said the plan contained four strategic objectives from the aspects of awareness, enforcement, labour migration, as well as access to remedy and protection for victims. Datuk Sri Saravanan said the issue of forced labour in the rubber glove manufacturing sector is set to be linked to local companies in September 2019, and to date three local companies had been banned, but it was withdrawn in March and September last year. In this regard, he viewed seriously the import ban imposed based on investigations by the United States Customs and Border Protection Department, US CBP, on rubber-based products manufactured by a subsidiary of Supermax Corporation Berhad. The ban, which prevented disposable rubber gloves produced by Supermax Corp wholly owned subsidiaries from entering the U.S. effective Thursday, was imposed following a withhold release order issued by the U.S. CBP the day before. This after the department said it had found 10 forced labor indicators in the company's manufacturing operations. Moving on, Perikatan National PN is set to contest all 28 seats in the Malacca state elections on November 20th. Its chairman, Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, said he had directed that negotiations among the parties in PN, including PAS and Gerakan, be held immediately. Saya dah beritahu kepada pimpinan parti-parti dan mereka pada dasar bersetuju, rundingkan segera supaya 28 kursi Dewan Negeri yang dipertandingkan di Melaka itu dapat dibahagikan uh, mengikut situasi dan keadaan uh, dan diharapkan kita boleh mencapai kejayaan. Tan Sri Muhyiddin also said he had already expected UMNO's decision not to work with PN but decided to wait for UMNO to state its stance or decision whether to cooperate to avoid clashes in the state election. On whether PN had any candidate for the chief minister's post, the Pago Member of Parliament said the party had many qualified candidates. The National Recovery Council chairman also hoped that the Election Commission will come up with the necessary standard operating procedures, SOP, soon to prevent a recurrence of what happened in the Sabah state election, which saw a surge in COVID-19 cases nationwide following the polls. Now, the Health Ministry is in the midst of conducting checks on premises that make three popular biscuit and cracker brands after a Hong Kong group claimed it found cancer-causing substances in their products. The Ministry's Food Safety and Quality Division said the manufacturers of the three Malaysian brands listed in the report were all certified and practiced strict food safety controls. The Hong Kong Consumer Council on Thursday claimed that high levels of cancer-causing substances were found in biscuits and crackers sold in Hong Kong. The council said it tested 60, it tested 60 samples of biscuits and crackers and found almost all contained glycidyl and acrylamide. On the Consumer Council's claim of inaccuracies in nutritional information, the ministry said food manufacturers were allowed to declare values on all allowable scale and wrong information would be checked as well. Monsoon season prompts flood warnings. We'll be right back with the details.
Welcome back. The Department of Irrigation and Drainage, DID, has advised residents in low-lying areas, flood hotspots and those living near rivers to remain vigilant and to prepare for the inter-monsoon period until early November. Based on the Malaysian Meteorological Department or Met Malaysia report, the country would receive weak winds from various directions that will cause thunderstorms and heavy rain along with strong winds in a short period of time. In a statement on Friday, DID Director General Dr. Nur Hisham Muhammad Ghazali said extreme rain can cause floods as rivers are unable to cope with such capacities in a short period and will break their banks and this will consequently affect low-lying residential areas. He also said the department has taken the initiative to implement flood mitigation projects and to prepare the Integrated River Basin Management Plan, Flood Mitigation Master Plan and the Storm Water Management and Drainage Master Plan as preparations against floods. In addition, the department has also continuously implemented maintenance of rivers, flood retention ponds and department infrastructure periodically. The Shah Alam High Court on Friday was told that former Home Minister Dato Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi was just following the orders of Dato Sri Najib Tun Razak, who was his boss then, in approving the extension of the foreign visa system VLN contract to a private contractor. This was revealed by a witness under cross-examination by the Defence Counsel Hamidi Muhammad Noor during Dato Sri Ahmad Zahid's corruption trial involving 40 charges in connection with the VLN project. According to fourth prosecution witness, former Home Ministry Deputy Secretary General for Policy and Control, Dato Suryani Ahmad, Dato Sri Najib, who was then Prime Minister, had given instructions to the accused for the continuance of the contract. She added that this was based on minutes jotted down by Dato Sri Najib, dated May 23, 2013, on Ultra Kirana Sindhya Berhad or UKSB's application letter for the extension, which stated that the project needs to be continued. During re-examination by Deputy Public Prosecutor Gan Peng Kun on the notes in the minutes regarding the period of the contract extension, the witness also said the approval of the extension of the contract was done in a rush. She previously testified that prior to an approval of an extension, the ministry needed to evaluate the company's performance first. However, this was not the case for the six-year extension granted to UKSB, which had been approved overnight. The trial before Judge Dr. Muhammad Yazid Mustafa continues on December 20th. In other news, Dr. Sri Najib has applied to amend the dates of temporary release and return of his impounded passport for him to visit his daughter in Singapore, saying that he was needed to help UMNO election machinery in Malacca state elections later next month. He said he was entrusted with the responsibility because AMNO President Dr. Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi would be in Germany to seek treatment for his spine injuries during the state election process. The Pekan Member of Parliament filed the application at the High Court on Thursday for the dates of the temporary release and return of his impounded passport to be amended from October 20th and November 22nd respectively to October 25th and December 6th for him to visit his daughter Noriana Najwa in Singapore as she is expected to give birth to her second child in early November. In the supporting affidavit, he said that the Court of Appeal had on October 18th granted him temporary custody of his passport for the visit, but he had to change his plan due to the polls. Judge Mohamed Zaini Mazalan sat next Tuesday to hear the application. <laughs> Police have busted a drug trafficking syndicate with drugs worth 1.17 million ringgit seized from two luxury condominium units used to store shabu and heroin during raids in Selangor on Tuesday. Kuala Lumpur Police Deputy Chief Dr. Yong Lei Chu said the seizure involving 45.93 kilograms of drugs was made after a 31-year-old local man was detained at the car park of a condominium located in Kajang. The suspect then took the police to another luxury condominium in Bangi, where most drugs were discovered, as well as a double-storey terrace house in Sri Kembangan, where authorities found cash totaling 60,520 ringgit. <laughs> in Pulau Pinang, a lorry driver pleaded not guilty in the Butterworth Sessions Court to charges of committing unnatural sex, raping and robbing a Myanmar woman, as well as robbing a local woman. 
25-year-old Zul Mazwan Zul Hilman, alias Suresh Kumar, claimed trial after the charges were read out to him before Judge Noor Aini Yusuf, who sat November 29th for mention of the case. The accused, who allegedly committed all the offences at two separate locations in Prai between October 9th and 12th, was granted 50,000 ringgit bail in one surety for all the charges. Malaysia among 46 countries allowed quarantine-free travel to Thailand. The details up next. Welcome back. To the foreign front, China on Friday urged Washington to tread carefully on Taiwan after U.S. President Joe Biden said the U.S. would defend the self-rule island from attacks by Beijing. Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin said China has no room for compromise on issues involving its core interests and warned that the U.S. should act and speak cautiously on the Taiwan issue. In the Chongfa Earlier, Biden said Washington would defend Taiwan if China attacked in an apparent departure from a long-held U.S. foreign policy position. But a White House spokesman later said that this, his remarks did not signify a change in policy. The U.S. has a law which requires it to help Taiwan defend itself. However, it pursues a policy of strategic ambiguity, where it is deliberately vague about what it would actually do if China were to attack Taiwan. An explosion and fire at a gunpowder factory in Russia on Friday killed 16 people. According to officials, the explosion hit the elastic factory in the Ryazan region, about 270 kilometers southeast of Moscow. Officials initially said that the blast killed seven people and left nine missing, but hours later announced that all those missing were dead. One person was hospitalized with serious injuries. The country's emergency situations ministry said the blast was caused by an unspecified failure during the production process, and 170 emergency workers and 50 vehicles were deployed to deal with the fire. Officials are investigating potential violations of safety procedures or a short circuit among possible causes. Thai Premier Prayu Chan Ocha announced Thursday that vaccinated travellers from more than 40 countries will be allowed to enter the kingdom without undergoing quarantine come November 1st. The 46 countries and territories is a significant jump from the 10 initially announced last week when he unveiled plans to reopen the country. 
next month. In a post on his official Facebook page, he said the ballooning list is due to Thailand's urgent need to stimulate the tourism sector and other related business sectors. Besides the United States, Britain and China, vaccinated tourists from a slew of European countries, including France and Germany, will be allowed in if they are able to provide a negative COVID RT-PCR test. Neighbours, Cambodia and Malaysia, are also on the low-risk list, as well as Singapore, Japan, South Korea and Hong Kong. Upon landing in Thailand, travellers, however, will have to take another COVID test and book a single night in a government-approved hotel while awaiting the results, before being allowed to travel freely. Marketa Vondrasova became the first to reach the semi-finals of the Kremlin Cup in Moscow following a straight sets victory over Anastasia Pavlyuchenkova on Friday. The 22-year-old from the Czech Republic secured a 6-4, 6-2 win and next faces either Anet Kontaveit or Gabin Muguruza for a place in Sunday's final. In another match, top seed Ariana Sabalenka was knocked out of the Kremlin Cup following a straight sets defeat to Ekaterina Alexandrova. Alexandrova secured a 6-3, 6-4 win and next faces either Maria Sakari or Simona Halep for a place in the final.
Now, as we wrap up Nightline this time around, let's take a look at this jaw-dropping video of a personal electric aerial vehicle in flight. Swedish-based startup Jetson unveiled the compact 92,000 US dollar eVTOL aircraft after successfully creating a prototype proof of concept in the spring of 2018, which the firm say took another three years to create a consumer-friendly version. With that, I'm Mohammed Amhamda. Thank you for watching and stay safe.